I never sing that last song without, and I've sung it all my life, but especially after a few trips overseas, and one in particular, that I always think of it. When we were in Pakistan, and all of the Muslims outside the area were crying out, Allah, Allah Akbar, which means God is great. And I thought, well, if I can go to sleep in the middle of all that, I can go to sleep about anywhere. <laughs> and that worked out all right. Sometimes we, in the air-conditioned auditoriums of worship, in our comfort, it's very easy to say, fear I cannot know. But it's one thing to do that here in the freedoms of our country. It's another thing to realize in the first century and in many places in the world that you would have to subdue a great deal concerning your own fear to be able to safely go with Jesus, but you can. Today, I am adding really to last week's sermon when we tried to study the difference in miracles and in providence. And the text I appeal to this week in our study is James 4, James 4, verses 13 through 15, James 4, 13 through 15. And you'll see in a moment what I'm talking about as we enter into this study, but I will say it is an extension in another area of the study of providence. James writes to Christians, saying to them, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now having read that, I would like to announce exactly what I'm going to talk about, and that is the relationship of the phrase, if the Lord wills, and providence itself. Now, John, in writing to Christians, and James wrote to Christians, John was writing to Christians, and he said in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, and this is the confidence. This is something we can be confident in, in other words. Put your confidence here. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. In going further into this in an introductory way, we need to define W-I-L-L, -L, will, as it's employed here. It is an act of or process of volition, conscious and deliberate action or choice. Again, showing we're free moral agents. We have the power to choose. Now, the phrase, if the Lord will, must be understood and must be studied in the light of the fact that nothing happens outside God's will. Having said that, we must understand that when he made man, though, he made him a being who also has a will, which could in freedom of choice thwart, now watch it, thwart the ideal will and or circumstantial will of God. But, now listen, but not God's ultimate will. 
God would have all men to be saved, Peter wrote. 2 Peter 3, 9. But the will of men thwarts God's will. All will not be saved. Some who would not be saved because they're free moral agents, have the power to change, will change and be saved. Others will be saved from past sins, added to the church and be Christians, and then they'll change their mind again and go back into the world and apostatize. But ultimately and finally, when all is said and done, God's will will be done. Now, it's interesting that our great God has set up a situation in this present world, a place of preparing to meet our God, if we use it like, right, to where we can make such choices and actually thwart to an extent God's ideal will, which in the case of salvation, he'd have all men be saved. Or even in circumstances. Remember, when it comes to Jonah, God would have had him go immediately once he commissioned him to go into Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and preach that those people need to repent. But Jonah put that off. He ended up doing it, but he put it off. He tried to escape. We know the whole story of Jonah and the great fish and all that. He finally accomplished what God commanded him to do. Even did that with a bad attitude. So you see how as long as life continues and we are in the flesh, here for a given reason to prove to God we love Him by faith in Him, taking Him at His word and supreme love of Him and obedience to the truth, then we can reject that because He's not going to make us obey Him when we don't want to. He's not going to force a person against His will. God appeals to us in the way He made us, rational creatures, and we make the decision to reject Him or to receive Him and believe Him and obey Him or disobey Him. Because once you've heard and know that it's Him, that doesn't guarantee you're going to submit to Him. Thus you have such admonitions as we quote most often, Two Christians who heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel, the Lord added to them to the church. Well, what then? Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, so that means I have to keep on keeping on, but I can choose not to. Be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a kind of life. Revelation 2.10. But I don't have to in the sense that I have the will not to. That's one of the wonders of God bringing everything into judgment. Every secret thing. When people who are opposed to the existence of God and a complete materialist, they don't believe anything spiritual, metaphysical. They cannot ever look for a time when justice will prevail over all things. Never can. A wicked person, as wicked as he could be, can live in this life from the materialist viewpoint, the atheist. And here can be a person, even the atheist would call a very good person. Both of them die. They just go out of existence. One doesn't have to meet his works or her works, as the case may be, from the atheistic standpoint. So they have a lot of problems in explaining why they're even interested in right or wrong in the first place. Or where any kind of right or wrong comes from, or right itself. Really, you have no problem explaining wrong if you have a code of right. It's just the violation of the code of lie. So sin's a transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. But now notice how Paul employed this phrase in Acts 18, verse 21. When he says to brethren, but I will return again unto you if God will. 
And that tells us also, though he had the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the other apostles did, that that didn't always mean that God was telling him thus and so, and it would happen. And to the puffed up persons in Corinth, he said, But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will. 1 Corinthians 4, 19. He also said to them, I hope to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. 1 Corinthians 16, 7. Permit there comes from epipetro, threpo rather, in the Greek word. And that's the reason it's the one who has the power to permit will either permit it or not permit it. And concerning going on to perfection, the inspired Hebrews writer wrote, and this we will do, and he does the same thing then Paul did, in 1 Corinthians 67, if the Lord permit, Hebrews 6 and verse 3, if the Lord permit, epitrepo. What's the idea in these passages? What am I supposed to understand about that since it's written to help me be better person and understand better the providence of God and understand how that fits in with my free moral agency to make choices? Well, the idea in these passages is to make all of life's plans in the light of the ultimate reality. Our faith in God is to be a vital factor in all existence and decision making. This is one of the things as you live faithful to the Lord, knowing faithfulness means taking God at His word pertaining to how one lives his life in the church. And thus we recognize God is to be taken into consideration. Now I wonder how many people, well for that matter, how many members of the church, and sitting down and thinking about what they're going to do and not do or make this decision or go here or go there, really realize that they should be thinking about what we just said right here, that our faith in God is to be this tremendous factor in all our existence and decision making. Now that immediately, though we're not going to talk about it now, would uh, for the Christians show again further importance of prayer and take note when you read about prayer in the scriptures or what it has to say, how much of that is involved in the taking of God into account as controller of all things and what he would have you do. <clears throat> now by the phrase, if the Lord will or if the Lord permit, we recognize our own limitations in knowledge. Notice what's said by James. We'll focus in on it, though we've already read it. Chapter 4, and verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You ever have somebody say of another person, you know it all? <laughs> Usually that said as a slur because maybe they do know a lot and they're always indicating what they know or whatever, but it carries with it some ideas that we ought to think about. James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote to brethren saying, you don't know what's going to be on tomorrow. I say again, really tomorrow never comes because we get here it's today. And certainly yesterday, we can't go back to that, can we? And we have no more assurance of tomorrow becoming to today than we do of going back to yesterday. There are people right now planning all sorts of great things tomorrow or dreading things that are supposed to happen tomorrow. They'll never see the sunset or maybe the sunrise because they'll leave this world before it ever happens. This also emphasizes our own limits in existence. Notice how James does it in verse 14 with a question, a rhetorical question. What is your life? That's a good question. I don't know of a time that we live, young, middle-aged, old, whatever, that we don't need to ask, what is your life? 
I don't know that we think enough about what is life in the first place. But what is, what is your life was put to people in the flesh on earth? And it was designed to make them realize, where are you placing your emphasis in what you plan and purpose and how you set out your time on earth, whether long or short? We know that it's only by means of the Lord's will that the world's here working like it does in the first place and that he preserves it by the word of his power. And God continually wills material creation to exist. That's enough to really make you think for a moment. He spoke it into existence in every law that exists in the material world. He spoke into existence, but he keeps it working. He's concerned about it. And he's concerned with its continuation. And only he knows when it's time for it to cease. So what is your life in the flesh on earth? But that wasn't put to the person outside of Christ, though it could have been. But James put it to members of the church. What do you do with your life? What does it amount to? Where are your concerns? There are people that have no concern about anybody else or anything else but just themselves. And the Lord had a lot to say about denying self, taking up your cross, and following Him. So we, therefore, must think about the transitory and uncertain nature of life. We would go a long way toward getting people to take the Bible seriously as the Word of God and the way from earth to heaven if we would get them to think about the transitory and uncertain nature of life. And James says you're but a vapor for his life on this earth is concerned. And you're here just for a little while and then you vanish. And that's right. Those of us who have put a few years on can now remember a great many people that we knew in school with, even later on in life, who departed and gone on. In just the last few weeks, one of my roommates in college, I found out, had died. And then just a few years ago, another one of my roommates, I found out, uh, had departed the premises. Both of them were members of the church. And you can just begin to think. Now, the younger people, you have a little bit more of a problem with this because you may not like to think of it, but you haven't been here long enough to be able to do that. You can with maybe certain people. Well, what is that saying to us, testifying to us every day we live, even if they're not people we personally knew or were close to? This life's a vapor. It appears for a little while, and it vanishes away. Now, what is your life in the light of that? So, in view of the brevity and uncertainty of life, and our lack of knowledge compared to God's, then we're to make our plans in complete dependence on God. Look at verse 15. For, what ye, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and move and have our being. This type of thing. I added to what Paul said in Acts 17 there. That's what we should do. We should do this or that. Temporary promises pertain to the intent of our hearts. Temporary promises. You ever made a promise? I think probably we have. Would it be possible for you to be as sincere and honest in making a promise to somebody, fully intending to perform it? but yet not be able to, though you wanted to and intended to and planned to and had the wherewithal to do it. So promises like this should be reasonably possible of accomplishment. Always take into account the limitations of human beings in view of known circumstances. 
And since we're unable to foresee possible contingencies, we must refrain from making our promises absolute. When you look at Paul, Silas, and Timothy, you see them at one point planning, and that's because they wanted to, to preach the gospel there, to go to Bithynia. That's what they intended to do. But the scripture tells us in Acts 17 and 7, but the Spirit did not permit them. Now we don't have the direct work of the Spirit as they did operating in those days. But brethren, you can plan to do a very wholesome thing from your perspective and limited knowledge. But God can providentially step in and say, not now. Again, that ties in about with prayer. And thus we pray that we can do thus and so and we want to do thus and so. But in our prayers, because of the, what we're trying to teach this afternoon, we will say, not our will, but thine be done. So if God's will, or God, or I should say God wills, or if God permits, means it may or may not be done. And that's what we've got to understand. And we in the church dealing with one another need to understand that. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon, 2 o'clock. Have you ever made such a declaration? And then not be there. Well, did you lie? Well, I don't think we would have deliberately. But circumstances, situations can thwart us. Paul was certain of God's providence. There's the thing that I'm tying into last week's lesson on just what providence is, providing without a miracle. Notice that he says, Concerning Onesimus, perhaps, perhaps, he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. Philemon, verse 15, perhaps. So Paul did not have direct involvement of the Spirit allowing him to see, yes, the reason he came here was because God, his providential care, sent him here so he could come back a Christian. Paul didn't know that. But perhaps that's what happened. In Romans 8, verse 28, we have, Now we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we know Galatians 4 and verse 4 makes it clear such as that happens. And I think you'll find that most of this and this principle of Romans 8.28 really is set in a context that's talking about how God from the very beginning till the time that the church was established worked through all manner of people and situations to bring into the world not only Christ, but all things pertaining thereto regarding your salvation and mine. This is a very positive announcement. Notice, we know. Now, Paul didn't know the future, but he knew who knew and who held the future, even as we can know it today. Notice it's unlimited, all things, all things. What is God's chief concern concerning mankind? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why? He wants everybody in heaven. For God so loved the world. He wants everybody in heaven. But he made us free moral agents because he wants people to serve him because they want to, because they love him. Because the evidence says we ought to. Thus the gospel is reasoning with us to choose the most obvious thing. Is it more reasonable to think that nothing produces nothing? Or is it more reasonable to think that life comes from life? And thus 
a matter of faith is by evidence we should believe in God. And we should believe in Christ. And the Bible is the Word of God. But that takes study to assemble that evidence. And then to think with the mind God gave us, reason correctly, proving all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And in the case of what we're talking about, it's good to believe that God is, that Christ is the Son of God, that the gospel is the power of God to save, and all other things the Bible obligates us to do to be able to enjoy the marvelous and wonderful grace of God Almighty. So, this is harmonious and it's designed, knowing that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are calling, called according to His purpose. They work together. Tell me how. I don't know. I'm glad God didn't require me to be able to understand all He understands because that would rule me out immediately. <laughs> He's given me what I'm capable of understanding, what I need to know. I always hear this business. This is a on a need-to-know basis. Deuteronomy 29, 25 makes it clear. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed unto us and our children forever. That's a need-to-know basis. What I need to know to get from earth to heaven is right here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. And we're studying part of it right here when we study James and we study about providence and we study about the free will of man and how it all works together and what we know and what we don't know and what we trust God with. Now, notice Paul didn't say that everything that happens is good. I've seen some people quote this as if, well, so-and-so had a wreck and cut his leg off. God will work that out for good. That's not exactly how that goes. That's not a good, you can say, well, it's a good thing he cut his leg off or he might have never learned the truth. Well, I'm glad he didn't cut his head off. But as we constantly adhere to the truth of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, then we will eventually see it all come together. It's not going to be done overnight. You rise in the water to the grave of baptism. Everything that there is to do with Christian maturity will not be understood in a matter of hours. How do I know this? Well, a lot to learn in the Old Testament sure would help us be faithful in the church under the new. And I just simply say, have you heard of the patience of Job? And it's James that says that. Job is a very righteous and godly man. He's lived his life for a long time in that way. But there's still something Job doesn't know about himself. And God puts him through all of this or actually permits the devil to put him through all of it. And when you read the closing verses of Job, he's greater than he ever was when it starts out. Because he endured. That's the fundamental reason of patience. It's different from the way we use patience nowadays. Patience in the New Testament means bearing up under the burden, and in doing so, you keep on doing what God said. That's the idea. Then you see it perfectly set out in the life of Jesus. Look what he endured. Look at his patience. It's restricted in its application, Romans 8, 28, to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Now there's the key. Those who love God and are called according to His purpose. How is a person called to God? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's to be preached to every creature. Mark 15, 16, 15. That's how people are called. That's the only calling. You hear some of these uh, preachers jump out. I was called. You weren't called. Except in a general sense, if you're a child of God and you want to preach, you desire to preach the gospel. But a special calling where some still small voice or some sort of something happens and says, I want you to be my preacher. No such thing as that. Anybody that says otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. 
How is a person called to Christ today? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. The glad tidings of Christ. Now, called according to his purpose. Well, what's the purpose of a Christian? One who's of Christ, a member of the church. What's the purpose of the church? To do God's will. Of course, you have to have remission of past sins so that you can be a part of the church and walk in the light of sins and the light. 1 John 1 7. And his purpose is to get you to heaven. Your hope's in heaven. Your expectation is glory in heaven with Christ after this world's over with. All that's involved in what Paul says in Romans 8 28. It's not just everybody. That's not to the person outside of Christ. It's not to the unfaithful. If words have meanings, it's for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. It's to faithful members of the church. Because He's saying, hang on. Hang on to what? Doing what you know God said do. And it will all work out in the end. Thus you have John 14, 15, where Christ says to His apostles, If you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Now this is the love of God, John said in 1 John chapter 5, 3. This is the love of God. Well, if I were to say that to somebody, and they said, well, I'd like to know what the love of God is, and I would say, well, this is the love of God. That we keep His commandments. Can you understand now why that the devil would want you to think that commandment keeping is a bad thing? You're just a commandment keeper. I never have from the time I was a teenager thought that was any criticism of me. Would to God all men on this earth were commandment keepers of God? Because when you hear the conclusion, the whole matter is to fear God. The whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments. You have Luke 8, 15, the parable of the soils where the seed is the word of God, verse 11, and it's sown in the hearts or the minds of people who are honest and good. And you find Matthew 5, 6 talking about an attitude of mind like that. In John 7, 17, they are the people who will receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save their soul. And that's the best way, I think, for this time being that I can explain Romans 8, 28 and how it connects with what's being talked about in uh, James chapter 4, verse 13, 14, and 15. Concerning the ultimate will of God, our wills, and then God's providential care of the whole thing, and that He can see His people through if they will simply take him at his word and comply with it, in the end, you will hear, I promise you because God promises you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. That's the way it works. So if the Lord will, that phrase fits into or is related to providence, in that it acknowledges the involvement of God in all things in our lives and in this whole world. Moreover, it reminds God's children that though we do not know what's going to happen to us from one second to the next, God does, and He will take care of us as such care pertains to our needs in getting from earth to heaven. That's why that the conclusion of the whole matter is fear God and keep His commandments. So it's good to know what we can know, good to know something about our free moral agency, because we, we don't want to thwart anything when it comes to God's will being done. When we obeyed the gospel, we said, my life with sin is ended. I'm not going to the best of my ability to ever commit sin again. 
And as John said, if we do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So he's made provision even for the child of God that commits sins of ignorance and weakness and so on. But for the life of sin, it bothers me when members of the church talk about themselves as sinners. That term's never used in that way of faithful members of the church. That's used of the person who's in sin, an old creature outside of Christ, who's doing just as he pleases, as he wills to do regardless of God's will. But that's not so in the conversion process. There is something to this business of conversion. A great change has taken place. And I will now for the rest of our lives is to do His will and to realize God directs us through His Word in the sense that if we will stay true to Him, our prayers are answered. He'll give us as we need. He will guide us and heaven will be our home. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we urge you, we beg of you to consider these matters, to prepare yourself to meet your God by obeying the gospel and being faithful to Him. If as a child of God you've wandered from Him, you've committed sin, we urge you to repent of those sin or sins. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the invitation of Christ along these lines, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.